Good morning, Sonoma Valley Community Church family and friends. We're so glad to see you this morning. Amen and amen. This is the third Sunday of Advent, which is, which is saying that we're getting closer to celebrating that very important day in our year where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on earth in Bethlehem. So this morning we recognize that God is at work in our lives. Yes, there is a challenging world out there. Yes, there are problems. But this morning we focus our hearts, we focus our minds on the love and grace and presence of God in our, in our world. And so I want to invite you to join with us in a word of prayer and then worshiping together. Lord God, we pray that you would bless the people who listen this morning. We pray, Lord God, that you would give favor to those who listen and watch. Lord God, we pray that this service might be multiplied into hundreds of people watching at different times in the coming week. We pray, Lord God, that they would watch not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Lord God, may you draw them, may you counsel them with your eye upon them. Lord, may you bless us with your love your favor, your mercy, your grace, your goodness, and your kindness. Lord God, help our hearts to be anchored in the truth of who you are and the truth of all that you are doing and have done. Lord God, may it also be in the truth of your word that we rest our spirits. Lord, bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So we want to sing a song called I Worship You, Almighty God. God. Isn't that true? There's none like Jesus Christ speaking through his spirit into our hearts and our souls. And this morning, as we were coming to church, 
Of course, we'd already planned to sing We Three Kings of Orient Are, a favorite Christmas carol that many have sung through the ages, through time, since it was written. But my wife, Charlotte, all of a sudden got inspired that the whole gospel is in that song and that there is special uh, insight that thrilled her heart as she was singing in the car as we were coming to church this morning. So we're going to sing all five verses because we're inspired by what God is saying in this wonderful hymn, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Come all ye faithful. If you're standing wherever you are, that's great. We're standing because we love our Lord and God and we're faithfully following after him.
Charlotte, as we sing to our Lord and worship Him, we want to also recognize that we are inviting His presence into our lives, into our community, into our homes. And that means that God is speaking to the clarity of how we think, to the health of how we think, and to the vitality of how we think. God wants to give us a new mind, a new spirit, not based on fear, not based on concerns, worries, and pain, but one based in the love, in the grace, and in the truth of who God is. And on that note, I just want to invite you to hear with me from Sarah Young and her devotional this morning talks about the importance of all of us listening to the truth of who God is. She wrote this five years ago, five years ago, and my, it seems so appropriate in this day. Everyone, she writes, on the side of truth listens to me. She's referring to God. I am truth incarnated. The reason I was born and came into your world was to testify to the truth. Many people believe there are no absolutes and that everything is relative. Unscrupulous people capitalize on this prevailing view by manipulating information in false ways to promote their own agendas. They present evil things as good and vice versa. This is abhorrent to me. As I said about all unrepentant liars, their place will be in a fiery lake. But remember that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. The more you listen to me, especially through reading the scripture, the more you will treasure truth and take delight in me, the living truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Ask him to give you discernment. He will help you navigate your way through this world where spin and outright lies are commonplace. Strive to str stay on the side of truth so you can live close to me and enjoy my presence. John 18, 37. For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And John 16, 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And we t he will tell you things to come. Thanks be to God's word. As we come together this morning, we have lots of things to celebrate. One of the things to celebrate is that we had that successful blood drive. But looking forward, this coming week, we have an opportunity to celebrate God's goodness with a virtual piano, piano concert that will be taking place right here. Right where I stand, we're going to move the piano that probably hasn't been moved in a decade. And we're going to move that piano to right here in the center. We're going to have Mr. Barrett Wilbur in concert to share with all of us some wonderful classical music and Christmas music that is going to lift our hearts and be a blessing in our lives. And so that's going to take place as a recording on Tuesday, the 15th of December at noon, right here in the sanctuary. And so we're going to invite you to watch that as soon as we can get that recorded. And uh, we just thank God for the opportunity to have a concert that lifts up God lifts up beautiful music, and lifts up people's spirits. We also want to invite you to uh, lift up your offerings and your gifts at this time. Offerings and gifts and, uh, and our, 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 our money and our, our, our time and our other kinds of treasures, these are the types of things that God has said he will turn into treasure in heaven. God has said in Matthew that through Jesus that, that all the things that we give to him he puts into the bank account of heaven. And he says also seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things 
will be added unto me. So the way we do that here at our church is we do that with prayer, we do that with joy, and we do that by slipping a check into the offering box, or we do that by, by sending money through the mail, or we do that by our giving page, which is ele electronically through our website at www.welovesonoma.com allows you to support the ministries of this church. And, as, and what are we doing? Well, this year we're proud to say that we have repurposed 10,000 N95 masks that have gone out into our community to help those who are less fortunate or not able to access those masks, to have those masks on hand in their homes and, and, to, and, and in their places of work. We've also had the privilege of putting together 140 boxes for children gifts with, uh, of, of all sorts in those little boxes, and they're, they're on their way now to other countries, 140 children that are going to receive those gift boxes, and I look forward to the possibility that one of those children uh, will be receiving my gift and might contact me here at the church. And we've also had the privilege of being part of a blood donation drive, and we had, as I shared with you last week, a lot of blood given here for our first time of having a blood drive. And we're going to be doing that again. So our church is alive with mission. Our church is alive with activity to help people in our community. And I want to take this time to now pray and ask for God's favor and blessing on our church, on our people who are struggling or who are, who are encouraged, and on our community. Let's pray. Lord God, we look to you this morning the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before you endured the cross, despising shame, and on the third day rose to newness of life. Lord, we thank you that you go before us, around us, beside us, and behind us and above us. Lord God, thank you for giving us a Redeemer in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord God, we pray that you would do a special work of comforting those who are feeling locked up in their homes, comforting those who are struggling with a family member who might have COVID or some other kind of malady. Lord God, we pray for, the, for you to work through us to help us express genuine empathy and care for people whom we meet. Lord God, help it to not just be in our heads, but to sink down deeper into our hearts. Lord God, I bring before you my neighbor, Gary, who's in a nursing home right now, my next door neighbor, and his wife comes over to bring cookies. And Lord God, he is, uh, he maybe doesn't have many days left. Lord, I pray that you would speak to him through the Bible, that you would speak to him through his wife, even though she can't touch him through the glass. And I pray, Lord God, that you would help me to have more empathy for everybody around me. Lord, help me to be compassionate. Help me to be a spiritual leader who is authentic and kind and tenderhearted and forgiving and insightful and full of the wisdom of God. I pray, Lord God, for depth and not just an image. I pray for substance over that which can be seen. I pray, Lord God, for Gary who lost a friend in the past week or two. Lord God, I pray for you to console him. I pray, Lord God, for you to minister to Margaret and to minister to Terry and to minister to all those in our church, including Diana. Lord, we need your grace. We need your strength. We need your love. We need your healing touch. 
Lord, I pray that you would have a healing touch ministry through this church. Lord God, that through simple and, and uh, kind and faith-filled ways, we can pray for each other and pray for our neighbors and pray for those we meet in the marketplace and in other places. Lord, help us to pray for them, with them, to ask, Lord God, if we might be able to pray with them and ask for them to receive the healing touch of God and the love and grace of God. Lord, help us to carry and bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love this church. I love this church because it always surprises me. Every week there's some new surprise. And uh, the surprise comes in the form of people that I have conversations with. It comes in the form of me being encouraged by my own congregation, just like I am trying to be an encourager to our congregation. And this morning we want to light the candles of God's love. So we have an Advent reading, and we're going to do something we've never done at this church. We've got it videoed. And so you're going to watch the candles being lit by the Romberg family by way of video. Let's watch together. Luke 2, 1 through 14. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest rooms available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God, highest in heaven, and on the earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. Thanks be to God. See? Did you see our lovely young team? Amen. Very exciting. Very exciting. You know, as a little church, we are growing in our technological prowess. We now are at two cameras, and we are now doing some recordings ahead of time. And uh, thank you, Olga, for playing behind that. And uh, it's just exciting to see how our church is moving forward in all sorts of ways. I'd also like to welcome Max. Thank you, Max, for helping out in the back. I'm so grateful for your additional uh, technological and personal help here this morning with producing this service. Well, with that said, let's go to our message. We're going to tackle Christmas again through the book of Job. And so I'd like to invite you to turn to Job chapter 32, verses 1 to 10, where we get another surprise. This surprise is truly uh, something that people who have paid attention to the book of Job don't expect, and that is a new friend, a new comforter, someone who pops up uninvited, it seems. His name is Elihu, and Elihu is younger, much younger than uh, the other friends, or even Job. And so this morning, we want to take a look at what Elihu has to say. You know, there's an old observation about the nature of life as seen from the perspective of those who are young and those who are older. Young people have all the energy and capacity to go and make things happen, 
even crazy things. But they are lacking in experience, judgment, and wisdom. Older people, seasoned people, those who have earned some of the gray hair on their head, have all the experience, judgment, and wisdom, but they may lack energy and capacity. Isn't it true? Life, it seems, is about that transformational exchange of energy for wisdom. So how is that working for us? It's been said that just because someone's old doesn't mean they're necessarily wise. Elihu says that. So how is it working for us? Whatever our age, how's life working for us? You know, people who are older but not wise could have been repeating mistakes, the same ones, again and again and again, and not learning from them. Empirical studies have shown that overall, older people are better than younger ones in terms of control over emotion, knowing themselves better, making better decisions that require experience, and having more compassion and empathy toward others. Isn't that interesting? Empirically proven studies. Younger people are still on the way to finding life's wisdom. So it's a surprise that a fourth friend of Job shows up to give Job a piece of his mind, and he's younger. His name, Elihu, and he's quite a bit younger. And as you start to look at what he says, there are five chapters worth of wisdom and instruction for Job and his friends. We're not able to get into all five chapters today. In fact, he chastises all of them and lets them have it because they're not speaking what is right of God. And along the way, he teaches new lessons that set Job up to hear from God and to finally find the success of understanding why he's been innocently suffering. In point of fact, God, I believe, starts speaking right after Elihu finishes. And God never rebukes Elihu because Elihu has set Job up to hear the similar or same message from God himself. What an amazing plot twist to have a young person inserted who speaks the truth in love. Well, this morning, as we go to our passage, let's start in verse chapter 32 and go for the first 10 verses. Here's what we read. Then these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But the anger of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned. Against Job, his anger burned because he justified himself before God. And his anger burned against the three friends because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were years older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of the three men, his anger burned. So Elihu, the son of Barakal, the Buzzite, spoke out and said, I am young in years, and you are old. Therefore, I was shy and afraid to tell you what I think. I thought age should speak, and increased years should teach wisdom. But it is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. Underline that. It is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. The abundant in years may not be wise, nor may elders understand justice. So I say, listen to me. I too will tell what I think. Isn't that amazing? God loves young people. God loves young people because they speak things out without fully appreciating all the political consequences that might come from what they say. And as we get older, you know, we get more cautious about what we say. But maybe we say more truthfully what, what is truly on God's line. In any case, it is clear that the older friends of Job have not done right by God, have not spoken what is right of God. And now Elihu gives it 
a shot. He, it, he splashes on the scene saying, look, let me talk. I've waited enough for you guys and I got some new things to say, some fresh ideas, some new insight. I have a fresh and young brain. You know, that's why people hire kids out of college. Because, not because they know all the answers, but because they're fresh young brains and they've got energy and they're willing to learn more. And so this morning we find Elihu in that role. As you look at the slide that's up here, you see that young man speaking behind Job and Job is there struggling in his, in his uh, pain and in his situation of having lost so much and in his grief. And you can see it on his face. And there is Elihu saying, hey, hey, stop a minute. These guys have not spoken what's right. And neither of you, Job. Job, you have tried to justify yourself. And you have not allowed for God to say the final word yet. And so as we look this morning, we want to invite God to speak his lessons into our hearts and minds. And the first lesson that we see is from this these 10 verses is that God speaks through his spirit to teach us up. He speaks through his spirit to teach us up. Elihu is, is speaking to us about the way that God imparts wisdom. He does it when the Holy Spirit connects with our soul, with our spirit, and then communicates to our spirit, and then that's lifted up to the level of consciousness where we have ideas. Now, not every idea comes from God, but when you do have a God idea, it becomes clear, persistent. It's that still, small voice of God speaking in your spirit. Go this way. Go that way. And many times, our ears are not attuned to God's voice. And that's what Elijah's trying to get at. Take a look at the next slide that we have here for a minute. Look at that slide. If you look at that slide, you'll see that there is an introduction of two chapters, and then Job speaks, and then Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar speak, and they go back and forth with Job for all of that. And then all of a sudden there's Elihu. See that light green? Five chapters of wisdom that God gives him. And then what happens? Immediately after Elihu, God speaks. And then there is a little bit of Job speaking, and then boom, there's the conclusion. So that's where we're at in our study of the book of Job. And what this highlights as a slide is that Elihu speaks, and he is actually speaking words and wisdom that God substantially agrees with. Because in the end, meaning in the conclusion of Job, God never says, Elihu has not spoken what is right of me. In fact, it is the young person that embarrasses us all, that he has a spirit that is sensitive to the wisdom of God. You know, I remember as a young person, Maybe I was only five, six years old. I remember saying to my mom about something, Mom, that doesn't seem right. And I, I never have forgotten that, that I was only five years old. How can a five-year-old know what is right and wrong? But you know, God put that in my spirit to tell my mom, Mom, I don't know why, the, why that's happening. That's not right. And, and that's not something that happens because, you know, you want to be obstreperous. It's, it happens because God's Spirit speaks to your spirit about something that you become consciously convinced about and where your conscience is sensitive to the issue of right and wrong. Now, some people don't have that sensibility very much. They don't seem to have the ability to separate right from wrong. They are shameless in all that they do. But Elihu is pointing out something very important. He says in verse 8, It is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty that gives them understanding. 
So as we go back to the slide of, of Elihu speaking to uh, Job, the big thought is that Elihu foreshadows the work of Christ on earth. You see, Elihu is the bridge between all that debate of those three different friends and God speaking. He sits right in between, right in between all that conjecture, all that speculation, all that attack to make Job give up his integrity and God having the final word. And Jesus Christ himself also worked on earth. You know, I've come to a, personally to a place where, in my thinking, where probably this book, the book of Job, in my mind, is the most important book in the whole Old Testament. I never, I never knew that, but through this time that we've had together, I've come to see that not only is it the oldest book in the Old Testament and in the Bible, but it sets up the need for a Redeemer. It sets up the need for Christ. It sets up the insight about how God speaks to us. It sets up the insight about God's intent for us. And it resolves an issue of innocent suffering since Jesus himself is the premier example of innocent suffering. Is he not? I mean, Job is innocent. God calls him blameless four times. And he will reward him in the end. But this is a shadow of Jesus himself suffering on the cross for our sins without any deserving related to it. Was Jesus deserving of a death on the cross? Absolutely not. And so we see that the book of Job in its own way foreshadows everything that's important in terms of God's message to us. Other books like Isaiah and Genesis and Deuteronomy and the Psalms and Ecclesiastes have also their own ways of speaking wisdom toward the need and work of God in human history. But the more time I spend in Job, the more I feel like I've just begun to scratch the surface of the book. And that there's so much more that we can learn about God and about ourselves. Let me give you an example. In this passage, in verse 8, he says, It is the spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty that gives them understanding. Where do we find that concept of the breath of God giving understanding? It's in Genesis. In chapter 1, verse 2 of Genesis, right at the beginning, we catch sight of the saga of the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. But what really gets things going is found in chapter 2, verse 7 of Genesis, where we read, The Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. This one little passage, this one little verse, this sentence, contains three significant facts about man's creation. And Elihu is touching on this issue by talking about getting wisdom through the breath of God. The first is that God and God alone created man and woman. The second is that God breathed his own breath into human beings. Man is more than dust or physical substance. Man is also spirit. We can picture it this way. Adam's body has just been formed by God from the dust of the earth, a lifeless human body lying on the ground. Then God leaned over and breathed his own breath of life into the man's nostrils. God is the source of life, and he directly placed life within man. This breath of life is seen again in John 20, 22, as Jesus imparts new life to his disciples. And thirdly, in Genesis 2, 7, we, we learn that man became a living soul as a result of God's breath. The word soul in Hebrew is nefesh, meaning an animated, breathing, conscious, and living being. 
Man did not become a living soul until God breathed life into him. As a physical, animate, rational, and spiritual being, man is unique among all living things upon the earth. So what is the breath of God? It is the life and power of God given to human beings to animate them. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, which means wind, breath, air, spirit. The life of God is passed from him to us and then from us to our children. Now, I can't say that there's much of any good about this pandemic, but I can say that all of us are struggling with the issue of breathing, right? I mean, when you put those masks on, you start breathing your own CO2 and, and you might get lightheaded if it's the wrong mask because you're breathing in your own CO2 all the time. And so we become all some uh, conscious of our breath as soon as you put that mask on. And maybe, maybe as, as a way to recontextualize our using masks, we can think of this as a way to remember that our life comes from the breath of God. And when you stop breathing, you're not, you're not alive anymore. And it's also the breath of God that imparts understanding into our souls. And that's what Elihu's getting at. Now God speaks for a second reason, not only to teach us up and give us wisdom that we wouldn't have, but also to redeem his people from the pit to set us up for success. If we go to Job 33, verse 23, we read this. If there is an angel as mediator for him, one out of a thousand to remind a man what is right for him, then let him be gracious to him and say, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresher than in youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then I will pray to God, and he will accept him, that he may see his face with joy, and he may restore his righteousness to man. He will sing to men and say, I have sinned and perverted what is right, and it is not proper for me. But he has redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and my life shall see light. Behold, God does all these oftentimes with men, Listen to that. He's saying he, God, God redeems people all the time to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Keep silent and let me speak. Then if you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Keep silent and I will teach you wisdom. What is Elihu saying? Elihu is saying that God is in the business of redeeming people who've taken a turn in the wrong direction, down the wrong alley. Now, it's interesting that this word, pit, is only found, I believe, one time in the New Testament as Jesus talks about justifying his own ministry. In Matthew 12, 9-13, we read this, Departing from there, he went into their synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might bring charges against him. But he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, he will not take hold of it and lift it out. How much more valuable then is a person than a sheep? So then... It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched out what was of shame and pain and embarrassment for all to see. And he stretched it out and was restored to normal like the other hand. Isn't that incredible? Here is Elihu speaking to Job and saying, 
Not only does God give you wisdom through his spirit, but God is in the business of redeeming people who have fallen into pits, like you, Job. And so what Elihu's starting to do is he's starting to say, look, I want to recontextualize your suffering. You're, you are not suffering because you deserve it. You are not suffering because you've done something that has offended God. You, have, you are suffering because God has lessons for you to learn. Isn't that incredible? Elihu is talking about the opportunity for us to learn from life's aches and pains and even from things that have not been right that have taken place in our lives. Now, oftentimes, the reaction that I would have would be grievance. Oh my God, I don't deserve this. And that's where Job has been. But what Elihu is saying is, get beyond whining and complaining about why something's happened in your life and ask, what can I learn from this that is going on? I either have to learn not to step into the same pit again, or I have to learn how much I cannot control everything in my life, and I need to trust in God to redeem me. Or finally, let's make sure that I've got a great relationship with God because I'm inevitably going to fall into a pit somewhere along the line if I don't pay attention or because I didn't learn much. Let me explain this to you in, in a very personal way. A little over a year ago, I had the opportunity to stand right here and tell you that I almost died that week. I was driving during a time of rain and my car wound up spinning out on the freeway because I hit a place where it started hydroplaning. And it spun and it spun and it was dark. I couldn't see where I was going and I just said, Jesus, help me! And I'm spinning and spinning and spinning around and the car came to rest. And you know, all this past year, when I've driven by that same place, I've remembered where that is because there's a sign saying San Jose City Limits. Okay? And I came within a couple of feet of my car hitting that sign. And there is an embankment off the freeway. But thankfully, I just slid in some mud. My car was muddy, but that was it. I hit nothing. I hit no other cars. But I got to tell you, this morning, driving to church, it was raining again. And I was with my wife this morning, and I was thinking, oh God, please don't let me hit another one of those hydroplaning places. Help me to keep my speed down. Help me to learn how to drive better in rain this time, because I'm not an exception to the rule. And guess what? It worked. I didn't have any accident on the way to church this morning. So what does that tell you? It tells you that, yes, you can have a disconcerting, disorienting, painful experience, but you can also learn from it. And Elihu is saying that here. He's saying, look, God repeatedly helps people out of their pit. And Jesus said, look, this is what I came for. This is my ministry, is helping people out of the pit. And so we realize that God is speaking through Elihu to Job and saying, look, you're not suffering because you deserve it. You're suffering because God has lessons to teach you. And those lessons are going to be very important to the next stage of your growth and life here on earth. You know, I can't help but think that, um, that there are lessons for us this morning. And I can see this in the story of Zacharias. Zacharias had his mouth shut because he doubted God. 
And then there came the point of his son, John the Baptist, being born. And in Luke 1, 67, he says this, And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit, with the breath of God, and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant. He has spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he spoke to Abraham our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Praise God. What, what Zacharias is saying is that my son was born, John the Baptist was born, to be a forerunner of the Messiah, of the one who will save us from our sins. And Elihu is speaking about redemption from a pit, just like Zacharias is speaking about the salvation of the people of Israel from their enemies. This morning, we want to invite God to speak his redemption and, re and, and, and to help us see that when problems come, he has lessons for us to learn. Now, the third and final lesson of our passage, of our, of our, of our friend Elihu, that I want to highlight, has to do with God's power. God's power. You know, um, God speaks truth. But it is his truth backed up by his power that gets our attention. If God spoke truth, but he had no power to stand behind his truth, we would be in a very sorry state. But when God speaks the universe into existence, he has power to make it happen. And all of a sudden, all the molecules and atoms and 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 secret forces between protons and neutrons and electrons, all of that comes into balance. And all of a sudden, there is a human being. All of a sudden, there is an earth. All of a sudden, there is an animal. And this, this wonderful man, Elihu, young man, vindicates God by talking about God's power. And in verse 5 of chapter 36, he says, Behold, God is mighty, but does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives justice to the afflicted. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne, he has seated them forever, and they are exalted. And if they are bound in fetters and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions, that they may have magnified themselves. He opens their ear to instruction and commands that they return from evil. If they hear and serve him, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they do not hear, they shall perish by the sword, and they will die without knowledge. But the godless in heart lay up anger. They do not cry for help when he binds them. What is God saying here and in other passages of chapter 36? He's saying that God orders the broad events of history. God has power to keep boundaries between nations. God looks down upon America as a, his own creation. He knows our nation is suffering with this pandemic. And God has the power to heal and God has the power to let people go to their eternal destination. I got to tell you that this issue of power is elusive because here in the Western world, we don't always see God's power at work. Unlike in Africa, for example, where they've seen all sorts of miracles happen. And for me, perhaps one of the greatest miracles that I've seen was when I prayed for Kathy Cunningham, who had need for a new heart to be put into her body. 
And twice she almost died on the operating table at Stanford. And she had called me and said, if I don't get a heart in the next couple of days, I will not be able to be a candidate for that heart. And I prayed with all, my, all that is within me for her, with tears. And the little ring happened. And within 24 hours, Stanford called her and said, we've got a heart for you. Almost twice she died on the table. But you know, she lived another eight years. And she had a marvelous life, serving people who were receiving back the remains of their loved ones from the Iraqi war, because she was a flight stewardess. And that was her special role, was to work with the families who were receiving the caskets from wars in foreign places. And God used her, and then we had a funeral service when she finally passed away because she couldn't live on that heart anymore. And the, the head of, of the airline was there, and hundreds of people were there to thank God for all that she had, had done. And I'm not able to say that I have any part in that, even though I was her pastor. It was God's power that saved her life. And this morning, I want to invite you to consider that we don't just worship God because he speaks truth. We don't just worship God because he speaks his spirit into us and gives us understanding. We worship God because he's the one who has the final power to deliberate human history. And so we pray to him this morning that he would have mercy and that his power would work through the vaccine through the people who are trying to deliver it, that his power would work in our lives to help us love one another deeply from the heart and put aside anger and bitterness and any, any kind of dispute and to seek to live at peace with all men. This is my Christmas prayer, that we would be a church of peace building of reconciliation and of helping people out of the pits that they find themselves. In Christ's name, amen. So we want to close this morning with a song that I don't know the words to by singing, but it is a very special song because we found it and saw the words and just really touched me. It's called Look and Learn and uh, I'm going to have Olga play that song, and I'm going to read the words, because I can't sing them. Look and learn from the birds of the air, flying high above worry and fear. Neither sowing nor harvesting seed, yet they're given whatever they need. If the God of earth and heaven cares for birds as much as this, won't he care much more for you when you put your trust in him? Look and learn from the flowers of the field, bringing beauty and color to life, neither sewing nor tailoring cloth. Yet they're dressed in the finest attire. If the God of earth and heaven cares for flowers as much as this, won't he care much more for you when you put your trust in him? What God wants should be our will. Where God calls should be our goal. When we seek the kingdom first, all we've lost is ours again. Let's be done with anxious thoughts, set aside tomorrow's cares. Live each day that God provides, putting all our trust in him. Amen and amen. I want to invite you to experience God's goodness this week as you close in on Christmas 2020. Think about how to love people 
who don't deserve your love, but who need your love. Think about how to bless our community. Think about how to love your family and keep safe and stay close to God. He will keep your heart focused on truth. And we'll see you next week as we celebrate Christmas 2020. God bless. Bye-bye.